God in true righteousness. Like the Bible, the verse lays it out like it's so simple, but yet like we walk around plagued. We walk around plagued as if like we're, we're stuck and we can't move, we can't change. And part of the reason is because we lack both solitude, time away from other people, and we lack time of silence, where we don't have information overload, where we don't have access to other people, where we don't have other voices coming in and whispering. Because these voices really inhibit and get in the way of the renewing of our mind. And the renewing of our mind is the essential step in order to begin to put on a new man. The renewing of our mind is the essential step to putting on the new man. John Calvin had a quote. He said, Our wisdom consists almost entirely of two parts. Our wisdom consists almost entirely of two parts, meaning like what we know can fall into one of two categories. Okay? Knowledge of God and knowledge of ourselves. Everything we know can probably fall into these two categories. What we know about God and what we know about ourselves. But as these two, these are connected together by many ties, it is not easy to determine which of these two proceeds and gives birth to the other. So what he's trying to say is that like our knowledge of God and knowledge of ourselves is so like closely linked to each other that it's almost impossible to say like, well, do I begin to know about God or you know, and then God teaches me about myself, or do I begin to know things about myself, and that in turn teaches me about God? You know, which one comes first? Do I learn about God first, and then He teaches me about who I am, or do I learn about myself, and then through understanding who I am, I begin to understand who God is? He's, what He's saying is that these two are so closely linked that we really don't know which one comes first. So most of what we know comes and falls into either of these two categories. St. Augustine had another quote. It's one of my favorite quotes. He says, How can you draw close to God when you are far from your own self? How can you draw close to God when you are far from your own, your own self? Essentially what he's saying is that, like, how am I to be in a loving, intimate relationship with God when I am unaware of who I actually am. If I am unaware of who I actually am, then how could I be in an intimate relationship with God? Because intimacy is based on two people or two beings coming together and sharing of themselves. Sharing of themselves. But if I do not know who I am, then the question is, well then, who is loving God? Who is loving God? And I'm going to tease that out a little bit, okay? So if I am unaware of who I am, then it's hard to say, then it's hard to actually love God. Because we put up a lot of fronts for people. We have a lot of different faces. We carry different faces. We show different faces to different people. And so, like, we're kind of all, to put it simply, like schizophrenic in a way. And so, if you have all these different faces, all these different attitudes, all these different personalities, well, which one of them is actually loving God? Is it like my nice face on Sunday that is loving God, but on Tuesday, when I know I gotta give a report to my boss, like, and I bring out a different face, is that person loving God? And then on Thursday, when I got a call, AT&T, because I keep on dropping calls, and I'm trying to get a new phone out of them, and I give them a nasty face, is that, is that person loving God? Like, we put on so many faces, so really, which face is loving God? Which, which person is in a relationship with God if we have all these different faces? If we live in all these different compartments of our lives? So how can we draw close to God when we are far from our own self? 
And he followed that up and he said, Grant, Lord, that I may know myself, that I may know thee. Help me to really understand who I am, my ins and outs, my strengths, my weaknesses, my ugliness, my goodness, the gifts you've given me, the weaknesses you've given me. Help me to understand the whole package of what I am because I desire to love you with all that I am instead of just love you out of my strengths and not of my weaknesses. I don't want to just love you out of you know, the good things I do and not love you out of the, you know, the shortcomings in my life. You know, when we are created, in Genesis 1.26, it says, Then God said, Let us make man in our own image and according to our own likeness. And so, like, hidden within this verse is the greatest, you know, key that unleashes a genuine relationship with God. Because if we are made in His image and in His likeness, then built in, side of us, is the key to understanding who he is. He has given us the key to understanding him, the key to opening an intimate relationship with us inside of us when he created us. But I, I want to quickly clarify, well, what does it mean to be in his image and his likeness? We have a God who thinks. We have a God who feels. We have a God who suffered. We have a God who experienced life with us. And in the same way, he has given us the ability to think. He has given us the ability to feel. He has authored our emotions. He has authored also our suffering. All because it bridges the gap between us and him. And inside of us, when we pay attention to what's going inside of us, do we begin to unleash and unlock the mystery of what we call a relationship with God. He created the key to the, the mystery inside of us when he created us. Because he wanted us, he wanted to share in our thoughts. He wanted us, he wanted to share in our emotions. When we say, I'm angry, he says, I've been angry too. You see what my Israelites did in the Old Testament? I've been angry before. I feel betrayed. He's like, I know what it's like to be betrayed. I feel like when I speak the truth and people attack me for the truth, Jesus says, I know what it's like to speak the truth and have everybody look at you like they want to kill you. So inside of us is the key that unleashes an intimate relationship with God. Proverbs 4.23 says, Keep your heart with all diligence, for out of it springs the issues of life. Keep your heart with all diligence, for out of it springs the issues of life. It's a key verse because as we walk through life, everybody has moments that strike deep. And it's how we really deal with those moments, those events in life that really strike to the core of who we are that really determines how we live from that point on. It's how we deal with the issues that strike deep to our heart in that time that determines how we choose to live life from that point on. If you're a spouse, for sure, you've gotten into an argument with your spouse. And an argument that hurts. An argument where words come out of our mouths that probably shouldn't come out of our mouths. Actions come out of our bodies that shouldn't come out of our bodies. And we leave hurt. We leave angry. We leave bitter. How we deal with that how we guard the issues of our heart with diligence determines what the rest of the marriage will look like. When we deal with family members, when we deal with friends, when we are hurt, how we deal with those issues that cut to the heart determine how we live life from that point on. 
And if we become artists at brushing things under the carpet and not dealing with them, if we become artists of distancing ourselves so much so that just the sting of what happened subsides and then I can just move on when we do that, we have not done what Proverbs 4.23 says, which is keep your heart with all diligence for out of it springs the issues of life. Because if what we, live, what we let live in our heart is hurt and pain and bitterness and no forgiveness, no reconciliation, no you know, skills on learning how to deal with difficult situations, learning how to you know, resolve conflicts, if, if, if those things leave our heart, what kind of heart do you have? But it's in those moments that hurt the, the greatest that the Bible says that David, sorry, that Proverbs writes, keep your heart with all diligence, for out of it springs the issues of life. But see, we live in a world where we lack solitude and we lack silence, and that stuff just takes time. To sit down with yourself in pain, angry, and to not have other voices talking to us, to not have other people interrupting us, to not have electronics like attracting our attention, okay? To not like, you know, I'm angry, I'm bitter. I could buy this t-shirt and Amazon Prime could send it to me in two days. There's no silence. There's no solitude to deal with the issues of the heart. Henry Nguyen is a, um, he's a scholar, very educated man, taught at very elite um, universities um, throughout this country. And, uh, and towards the end of his career, he left, and now I believe he lives in Toronto, lived in Toronto, and he serves at a small shelter for uh, kids who are, um, have, handicaps or mental disabilities. And he writes in, in one of his books, he said, solitude is the furnace of transformation. Without solitude, we remain victims of our society and continue to be entangled in the illusion of the false self. Solitude is the furnace of transformation. Without solitude, we remain victims of our society and continue to be entangled in the illusion of the false self. So what's this false self that he's talking about? So I want to go to the, um, the story of uh, the temptations, when Jesus was being tempted by the devil. And let's look at, you know, this was Jesus just like was baptized, started, and, and really hadn't even started his ministry. People started to know him only because like John the Baptist baptized him, and people knew John the Baptist. He was baptized, and then he went into the wilderness. He was a nobody at this time. He was a nobody at this time. Other than he, there was a prophesied king about, he had not rightfully declared, I am the true prophesied king. John the Baptist knew it. People were questioning it. But at this time in his ministry, he was a nobody as he walked this earth. And as he was in the desert for 40 days before starting his ministry on this earth, the devil comes up to him and says, If you are the Son of God, command that these stones become bread. Command that these stones become bread. What was the underlying temptation? If Jesus at this time was a man who was unknown, who had an enormous mission, which was the mission of salvation, and he had, and his goal was to win the hearts of people, and he's coming in with only three years left in his life. The devil comes and tempts him and says, If you are the Son of God, command that these stones become bread. Essentially, what he's saying is, You are what you produce. You are what you produce. If you are the Son of God, if you are this great son of God, prove it by producing bread out of stone. We're back up. All right? And this is common 
in our society, where we are challenged, our value as people is challenged, and our value, we are told that we are what we produce. We are what we produce. And this is one of the things that builds a false sense of identity, that I am what I produce, okay? Then he says, all these things I give to you, if, all these things I give to you. He takes them up on a pinnacle, and he shows them, or on a high mountain, and he shows them all the riches, all the different, you know, countries, and everything you can imagine. If you are, okay, if you are really the Son of God, all these things I will give to you, okay, what was the underlying temptation? I am what I have, my possessions. My possessions make me who I am. My possessions make me who I am. Last one. Takes him up to the pinnacle. He says, if you are the Son of God, throw yourself down, for it is written, he shall give you angels charge over you, lest you dash your foot. What's the underlying message? I am what others think of me. If you are really the Son of God, and people should think of you in a certain way, and you should be so precious that even if you fell, angels would come. Prove to me that you're really the Son of God by doing this, by throwing yourself off. Because if everybody says that you're important, then I'll believe that you're important. I am what others think of me. Popularity. So in this temptation, we have three things that really build this false sense of identity in who we are. Performance, I am what I produce. Possessions, I am what I have. And popularity, I am what other people say I am. And we play to these voices. We play to these voices day in and day out. Facebook tells us that we should post funny things. Our jobs tell us you are good as what you produce. And if you produce, I'll give you a raise. I'll give you a promotion. Or, if I have these things, this house, this car, then people will notice me. Then I'll be considered prestigious. Then people really won't know like what my bank account reflects. Like these things, performance, possessions, and popularity build a false sense of who we are. Ephraim said when we keep silent, we have time for interior prayer, which brings full assurance and for luminous thoughts, which fill the understanding and the heart with light. When we have silence, meaning when I shut off society's ability to send me messages of I am what I produce, I am what I have, and I am what other people say I am, okay? When I have silence and I shut these voices off, then I have time for interior prayer. And interior prayer on the inside, remember what we were saying earlier, is the key to a relationship with God. I have time for interior prayer, which brings full assurance and luminous thoughts, which fill the understanding and the heart with light. With light. So when I am silent, I have time to interiorly pray. And it's in that interior prayer that God brings the full assurance of our value as people, of our value as his children. But if we never get away from people, and if we never silence the voices, we never hear this voice. We never gain the full assurance that my value is not based on what I do or what I produce. My value is never based on um, my performance and my value is never based on what people tell me I am. It's in that silence that God clearly says, you are valuable because I made you like me. You are valuable enough for me to come and die. You are so valuable that in your 
weak times, in your sin, in your mistakes, that I would hug you every single time. But we don't get to that when we don't have silence. And we continue to play to the voices that create a false sense of who we are. So I'm going to skip back. Uh, skip the next slide and then go one more. One more. So let's go back. In Ephesians 4.22, let's read it again. That you put off concerning your former conduct the old man which grows corrupt according to the deceitful lusts. And be renewed in the spirit of your mind. And that you put on the new man which was created according to God in true righteousness and holiness. Now this is a process. This is not a quick fix. But one of the things that we can do is to, to begin to create rhythms of life. Rhythms of life. Times for work and time for break. Time for friends and time to rest. Time to be with people and time to be completely alone. Does it mean you will be less productive? Yes. Absolutely, you will be less productive. You will not return all the emails. Will people be frustrated? Sure, people might be frustrated. But what is to be gained by beginning in your weekly schedule to create blocks of time for work and for rest, for family and for silence, for friends and for retreat. It's not easy. People will always grasp for your time. And, and you will... And, and, and when we look at our schedules and we say, well, I will block this time off, I guarantee the second you block that time off, an urgent request will come. I have to meet you on Monday. I have to meet you Tuesday at 5.30. I guarantee an urgent request will come. And it'll be a good request too. I need you to help me with this problem. I really got stuck in this situation. And we think to ourselves, like, well, if I don't help them, what are they going to think of me? How are they going to respond to me? How am I actually being a good Christian if I don't go and help them? Are we actually being a good Christian? Or are we thinking our value comes from what other people say we are? how other people may describe us. There will always be things grasping for our time. But if we ever want to find like our intimate relationship with God, there needs to be solitude, leaving other people, and silence, hushing all the voices of this world. Without the two, there's no time for prayer. And prayer is what brings the internal voice of God to the forefront, where he redefines our value, where he redefines and he says, you are not what you produce, you are not what you have, and you are not what other people say you are. You are mine. Silence, solitude, lead to internal prayer, and a reuniting with our true self, which is a reuniting with God. And in those things, then we find how to be renewed in the spirit of your mind, that you put on the new man which, create, which was created in God in true righteousness and holiness. And glory be to God forever. Amen.